Okay. Why don't we get started? Awesome. Um, I'll just do some quick housekeeping notes. I think we've got a lot of new people in the in the chat today. So um, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for our fifth online training session. Um, we've got a lot of people joining us from around the province and I understand from other provinces as well. So uh, thanks for taking the time out of your evening uh, to join us tonight. For those of you who are new to our Zoom sessions, a couple notes. Uh, if you have a question that comes up during Andrew's talk, you can throw it down here somewhere. There's a chat function. Please type your question in there. I'll be kind of monitoring that box and we'll do a question and answer period after. If it's something super pressing that you need to get out right away, there is a reactions box down in the right hand corner. You can wave your hand and we can, um, I guess, unmute you at that point and you can ask your questions. Otherwise, there'll be a session afterwards. Um, once all the chat questions are answered, we can open it up and have a discussion uh, as, as needed. Otherwise, I'll hand things over to Andrew and we'll get started. Awesome. Um, yeah, big thanks to you guys for organizing. This is actually my my first one of these as well. Um, it's been a little while since I've had a had St. John events. Um, life tends to get in the way. Um, just to emphasize Anna's point, I am more than happy to take questions as we go along. This is entirely for your benefit. Um, so just let me know what I can do to clarify things. And just for those more pressing questions, if there's something getting in the way of you understanding moving forward, please ask and uh, maybe Anna, you can, maybe you can interrupt me just so people don't feel bad about interrupting. Um, uh, that way those questions get out if they do need to. Yeah. All right, so yeah, we'll aim for, it sounds like from um, uh, what Nick told me, an hour to an hour and a half, if people need to go at any point, I am not offended. Um, if, it's too, if it's boring for you, please feel free to drop out, that's no problem. Um, I'll try and make it as, uh, as interesting as I can, and again, more than happy for things to be interactive. And I'm, uh, again, happy to stick around at the end. So our topic today is an intro to toxicology and uh, focus on drugs of abuse. So we all work in event medicine, uh, pre-hospital care, and these are events that we tend to go to a lot. And it's, a, I think, important to have a little bit of an understanding of the more advanced um, topic uh, topics and subject matter just to, at the very least, be able to understand what you're seeing, even if it doesn't actually change your practice. Um, just before we get going, um, so Anna, you said most people are British Columbia, but we have some people from Ontario as well. Are there any other provinces as far as we know? Anybody can speak uh, up if they're from elsewhere? We've kind of shared it in BC and then through our contacts in Ontario, but I don't know how far that's spread from there. Great. And just uh, skill level, I'm assuming I'm going basically from MFR level. Um, do you know how far, I'm assuming paramedics, probably some nurses? Um, yeah, division I one, I can speak to division 176. We've got a lot of EMRs and okay. PCPs. Uh, we've got some nurses, a couple doctors. So I'm assuming Great. similar. So broad range. Yeah. Perfect. So we'll start with the basics and move on from there. Um, I will start with just a little bit about myself. This is me and my dog, Clifford. Um, so I grew up originally in Victoria, uh, which is how I got involved in Div 176. Um, born and raised there and went to University of Victoria for undergraduate studies. And at that point was when I got involved with St. John back in 2010. I was the divisional superintendent for about three years during that time and had the opportunity to work with, with uh, a lot of amazing people before coming over to Vancouver for medical school after that. Um, I got more involved in the event medical side of things with mass gathering medicine and mass gathering health over here in Vancouver. Um, for those of you over here, you may have met uh, uh, Dr. Adam Lund at some point, who is one of the mass gathering medicine gurus here. And um, uh, now I'm doing emergency medicine residency. So it's a five-year residency training. I'm based mostly out of Royal Columbian Hospital, but we work all across the province. So Victoria, Kamloops, all over the lower mainland. 
um, and I'm doing a, a fellowship this coming year in pre-hospital and transport medicine, which is essentially the same as emergency medical services with PCNOs. Okay, so we're going to talk about a number of areas, but specifically non-prescription drug use and drug abuse, which we'll just kind of refer to as drug use uh, from now on. It's extremely common in our society today. Uh, the use of mind-altering substances has existed pretty much since the beginning of human civilization. Most of these substances and many that we still use today are primarily uh, plant derived. So like use of cannabis dates back to around 2700 BC, opioids to around 300 BC. Uh, and in 2014, which is just before the peak of Canada's opioid crisis, um, it really emphasizes the impact on our society. Um, so at that time, there was uh, approximately $38 billion of um, uh, lost productivity, healthcare costs, and criminal costs associated with um, with drug use in Canada. Interestingly, though, the majority of this cost, about 70%, is attributable not to the drugs that we typically think of, so heroin, methamphetamines, LSD, and the scary drugs that we typically stigmatize, but almost entirely to alcohol and tobacco. So alcohol alone contributed 40% uh, of the total cost of $14.6 billion, and that's likely gone up in the meantime. So today we're going to chat a little bit um, about a lot of things. Um, we're in the provision of pre-hospital care um, as pre-hospital care providers. We do come up against a different population than I just referred to. We have people who are disproportionately using substances outside of alcohol and tobacco, those though those certainly uh, uh, are seen. And in order to provide care to these people who are using mind altering substances, we need to have a basic understanding of tox principles as well as uh, an understanding of the individual substances. Everything I'm gonna chat about today will be very broad strokes and uh, certainly some generalizations will be used in the interests of simplicity. Um, these may not be specific in some cases to festival medicine or to your level of practice or scope um, and always take it with a grain of salt and, and refer to your own scope of practice. Um, again, I'm happy to be interrupted. Uh, so we'll chat a little bit about anatomy and physiology without delving too deep uh, into that. Then we'll chat about an approach to the toxicologic patient in general. Um, we'll chat about something called toxidromes, uh, the toxicologic history and physical exam. So what you want to ask and what you want to look for. And then we'll talk about some specific common drugs that you're going to see. So in order to understand much of toxicology, we really need to understand the human nervous system. Um, this is basically divided into uh, a number of divisions. First, we have peripheral and central. So central is your brain and spinal cord and peripheral is all the nerves moving out from there. The peripheral nervous system is then divided into the somatic, which is basically your voluntary um, uh, nervous system. So the ability to uh, control your muscles, to squeeze a hand, to um, uh, lift a weight. Um, alternatively, you have the autonomic nervous system. So that's your involuntary nervous system. It takes care of things like uh, digestion, your heart rate, your respirations, things that you don't normally think about. So this autonomic nervous system is where the money lies for toxicology. This involuntary system controls your unconscious bodily functions. There are very complicated diagrams like this that will make your head spin, um, but we're not going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about the real basics of anatomy and the physiology and what it actually does to your body. So at the macro level, we have two major uh, systems within the autonomic nervous system. We have the fight or flight response and we have the rest and digest response. Those are respectively called the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. So starting with the sympathetic nervous system or your fight or flight or freeze as some people add in response, this is our primitive reactionary response to a threatening situation. This is ingrained in our evolution so much that we don't think about it. When our body recognizes a threatening situation, it automatically engages our physiology to help it respond, either to escape or to overcome an opponent. Your body automatically releases stored hormones like epinephrine and norepinephrine, which cause a number of physiologic changes. 
We'll take a minute here and think logically about what your body would want to do if it needed to fight or flee. The first obvious one is to increase your heart rate or tachycardia. Tachycardia improves your cardiac output or the movement of blood around your body. This improves your circulation, delivery of blood to your muscles and organs that really need the blood in that situation. You also tend to have a constriction of blood vessels, which increases your blood pressure and your blood flow. From a pulmonary perspective, we bronchodilate or open up the lungs and increase our respiratory rate to allow maximum oxygenation and ventilation. Pupils dilate uh, in order to take in more light to see things um, uh, uh, more effectively in low light conditions. Sweating is initiated as a thermal regulatory mechanism. You can think if you're, if you're having to fight for a long period of time or, or run away, you don't want to have your body overheat and uh, become dysfunctional. Um, this will be important later when we talk about some of the maladaptive responses to, of, uh, of certain toxins because, because hyperthermia uh, is a failure of this thermal regulation to maintain normal temperatures. As far as the gut goes, um, it's kind of the opposite. We don't really need our gut when we're running away or when we're fighting, so we have vasoconstriction and a, reduce, and a reduction of blood flow to these non-essential organs. Um, <clears throat> this is good for a short period of time, but it can become maladaptive over a longer period of time. Similarly, blood flow to the skin is decreased. This is why patients who are acutely ill often have that cold and clammy appearance. They're vasoconstricting or decreasing blood flow peripherally in order to shunt it centrally to the organs that need it, the heart, the brains, and the kidney. On the flip side, we have rest and digest. Um, we'll just briefly touch on this, but this is essentially the opposite. So we shunt blood from things like muscles to our gut, allowing us to uh, slow things down, store energy, and maintain uh, normal homeostatic mechanisms. The parasympathetic nervous system transmits signals to their organs, so for example, the heart, using molecules known as neurotransmitters. Uh, again, I'm not gonna get into a lot of the detail on this because it just becomes confusing, but there is one molecule that we should know about. And that one's called acetylcholine. Um, acetylcholine, if you look at the diagram here, there's these little <coughs> blebs on the inside. This is the end of a nerve. And then on the other side, you can think of that as the heart tissue, um, just as a single example. Uh, when the nerve signal comes down and it gets to the end of the nerve, it triggers release of these little blebs. And inside, the dots are acetylcholine. That acetylcholine goes across and it finds its receptor and attaches there, causing a response on what's labeled there here as the postsynaptic membrane. So that would be the heart tissue. Now, simply put, acetylcholine is the light switch. It flips it on, activating the rest and digest system. So here's a very complicated diagram that we're gonna go through in detail over the next few slides. Um, when we have patients that take toxins, we don't always know what they take. We try and use our history and our physical exam off, uh, more often to identify the specific toxidrome that they're displaying. So a toxidrome is basically a, a series of physical exam findings that tend to point us in the direction of a particular type of toxin. And this can be very useful as a lot of our patients tend to be altered, unable to tell us exactly what they took. So this diagram just gives us the main types of toxidromes that we're gonna encounter more commonly in uh, regular festival medicine practice. This is by no means exhaustive and patients will certainly present with significant variability, <laughs> but it will give you an idea of what they might have used and it might give you an indication of what kind of treatments you need. Some of the details on this chart may be incorrect, um, so don't take it uh, directly at face value, you just use it as a guide. Um, today, we're gonna focus primarily on these bottom three, opioid toxicity, sympathomimetic toxicity, uh, and sedative hypnotic toxicity. The other two at the top, or anticholinergic and cholinergic toxicity, really aren't seen all that often in festival medicine. 
um, or in real life in general. Um, <clears throat> but I do want to mention them and just provide you with a quick example of what those might entail so you're, so you're familiar with it. So uh, briefly, cholinergic toxicity or the cholinergic toxidrome comes from an excess of the parasympathetic nervous system. So it's your rest and digest function taken to the extreme. This is from an excess release of acetylcholine. So if you remember from our last slide, acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter used to, for rest and digest functions. So if we look at that on the extreme, we get vomiting, diarrhea, crying, also known as lacrimation. Uh, we get a slow down heart rate. We get slow respirations. Our pupils may constrict. So these toxins commonly include pesticides, and this is not as much of an issue here in, uh, in North America, but it's one of the leading causes of suicide death, especially in developing countries such as um, Sri Lanka and India. Um, uh, the common name for those toxins are the group of organophosphates. Also, probably more commonly seen in, uh, in movies and, and uh, and sometimes in the news are chemical nerve agents. So that would include sarin gas and VX as examples. Um, the anticholinergic toxicity or toxidrome is the opposite. So this is when we have a, a blockade of that acetylcholine and we're gonna do essentially the opposite of rest and digest, which is very similar though not quite the same as the fight or flight response. Um, the big difference between the two, which I'm not going to get too much into, is uh, that in a fight or flight response, they tend to sweat, uh, whereas in a anticholinergic toxicity, they tend to be quite dry. Um, so examples of this type of toxicity uh, include really common medications like over-the-counter antihistamines, Benadryl, Gravel, a lot of psychiatric medications, um, and it uh, as well as uh, a number of common plants, including uh, belladonna or deadly nightshade. I just want to pause there and see if anybody has any questions at this point that they want to uh, bring up before I move on to a few other areas. Yeah, there's nothing that's come up in the chat, but if anyone's got anything, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. Uh, someone asks, would this be in the excited delirium range? Yeah, yeah. And so interesting question. Um, so for anybody who's not familiar with it, excited delirium or agitated delirium, which is something we can chat a little bit more about later in more detail if you guys would like, um, is a very, very interesting um, phenomenon. So these are the people that uh, you sometimes see on YouTube videos or police takedown videos who are extremely agitated, like, like agitated to the point where it takes four, five, six full grown police officers to take this person down and they're still almost getting away. They tend to have almost superhuman strength. They're very, very, uh, much in that, what we're going to discuss in a minute, sympathomimetic type uh, toxidrome. So they're hot, they're sweaty, they're tachycardic, they're hypertensive, they're, they have dilated pupils. And this often will go along with those type of drugs that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Um, and these people are very dangerous both to themselves and to others, um, and they require a fairly aggressive response. So to answer your question, um, if I understood it right, um, I'm not sure if you were asking specifically about the anticholinergic toxicity. Uh, that generally does not cause excited delirium. Um, it tends to be more of the sympathomimetics, which we'll talk about in a bit. So that would be uh, cocaine as, as a kind of prototypical one. Uh, any other questions that came up, Anna? Uh, no, there's none at the moment. Great, all right, so we'll move on and I'll, I'll take uh, another break in a little bit and we can check in on you guys. Um, okay, so now that we've got kind of an overview of the nervous system component of it, as well as the toxidromes that we're, potential, that we're gonna look at in a few minutes, I just wanted to get into history and physical examination for toxicologic patients. 
Uh, again, remember this is this may be out of the scope for some of you, um, and it, it, again, uh, practice based on your scope. Uh, but I think it's also useful to to you know uh, uh, mentally go outside of your scope and just from a from an educational standpoint. So. Uh, in understanding most tox problems, it's ideal to be able to know what burden that toxin is going to have on the body. Um, this is going to be determined by a number of different important factors. First of all, we need to know what the patient was exposed to. Uh, unfortunately, with a lot of our patients, especially at music festivals and other events, this history can be unreliable at best and a lot of the time patients may have taken a number of competing substances and may have mixed toxidromes or, or very clouded pictures. Um, this is why we rely on toxidromes because we don't have good history but as I said they may, uh, they may fall into multiple different categories based on their physiology. In addition to knowing which toxin patients have taken, the next most important thing, and often the most elusive, is, is the dose. This is easy for us in the ER if somebody's taken an overdose of their uh, antidepressant medication or uh, a Tylenol overdose, because typically we can figure out two within a, um, a reasonable um, uh, range of error, approximately how much that person's taken. But when we're talking about illicit substances, it can be very difficult to know what type of doses we're talking about. Not just because the patient doesn't know, but also because the doses don't fit into um, units that we understand or that we're familiar with. For example, how much is a tab of MDMA or Xanax? Uh, we don't usually know um, how the product was made. So ideally, just to simplify things, for a basic toxicologic history, we want to know ideally what the patient took um, and if they took anything else along with it, including common things like alcohol, uh, what time they took it, or if they took it over a prolonged period of time, how much they took, uh, if we're able to figure that out, uh, how they took it, did they inject it through a vein, did they smoke it, uh, did they ingest it, and any current symptoms that might direct us in, in, a, in uh, towards a specific toxin. So are they having a decreased level of consciousness, hallucinations, seizures, chest pain, shortness of breath, abdominal pain, and so on and so forth. Um, and lastly, did they have any complications as a result of their being intoxicated? So for some of the toxins we'll talk about in a little bit, the toxin itself is not particularly dangerous. For example, um, magic mushrooms the, themselves don't have a lot of toxicity. Uh, same thing with LSD, but a lot of the times people can become so paranoid and occasionally psychotic, but typically just paranoid that they go and accidentally hurt themselves or hurt others as a result of that. On the opposite side of the coin to the history is the physical examination. And we've touched on a few of these uh, superficially, um, but this is gonna involve an assessment of the patient's body response to the toxin. And it's actually fairly simple. We don't really require a lot of intricate testing for most toxicologic patients. Uh, first thing is first, and we're gonna do this on almost every patient, is a complete set of vital signs. So heart rate, uh, fast, slow, regular, irregular. Respiratory rate, fast, slow, regular, irregular. Blood pressure, high, low, normal. And oxygen saturation, normal, low. Temperature is particularly important for a number of, the, number of these uh, toxicities as they can become quite hyperthermic. Um, and a glucose level. Uh, certain toxins can make your glucose low and it can found the picture uh, because a patient might be more confused because of their low glucose than because of the toxin itself. Uh, many of these toxins are gonna affect the brain and nervous system. So we wanna get an exam on the level of consciousness. So a Glasgow Coma Score, eyes, verbal, and motor, um, an assessment of the patient's pupils, which is a component of our autonomic nervous system like we discussed before. And then a little bit more on the complicated side is an assessment of muscle tone. So do they have rigidity? So very stiff muscles, uh, which can direct you towards certain toxins or certain complications of toxins uh, and their reflexes. So are they, do they have absent reflexes or generally more commonly uh, uh, 
very hyperactive reflexes, uh, indicating that there's a lot of nervous system excitability that everything's ramped up. A basic cardiac examination, respiratory examination, and abdominal examination, as well as an assessment for trauma, are usually done, uh, but they may or may not offer much uh, information unless you specifically uh, suspect a toxin that will affect those organs, uh, for example, an inhalational injury. Um, lastly, the skin is a very important component as well. So what you're looking at here is what we, is called in toxicology the tox handshake or the toxicology handshake. Um, so patients, most patients, uh, even those without any um, intoxication, will typically have some component of sweat in their axilla or in their armpits. Those with uh, certain toxicities like uh, stimulants will have lots of sweating. Um, but the absence of sweating, the complete absence of sweating can direct you towards um, fairly specifically an anticholinergic toxicity. So it's a, it's a relatively useful test um, uh, and it adds to your physical examination. Once we've gone through our history and physical, the next component of it is a risk assessment. So we take all of those pieces of information, we take what they've taken, how much they've taken, when they took it, an assessment of what symptoms they might be having, an assessment of their physical examination and their vital signs, and we come up with a risk assessment. So we figure out, depending on which setting we're practicing in, what do I need to do with this patient? So who do I need to call? When do I need to call for help? How much help do I need? Do I need to transfer this patient? Uh, do I need to do anything immediately in terms of their management? And that's going to differ uh, fairly drastically depending on your personal scope of practice, what type of event you're working at, and uh, what resources you have. So if you're working at, let's say, at a um, music festival in, 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 down in Stanley Park in Vancouver, your threshold to transfer somebody out to go to St. Paul's is going to be a relatively uh, low compared to if you're working at Shambhala Music Festival, where a transfer means a dedicated ambulance and multiple hours of driving on potentially risky and uh, potentially risky terrain uh, with a patient who may have an altered level of consciousness or airway issues. So that's a, a single slide, but a very, very important and complicated component of uh, assessment of toxicologic patients. I'm just going to pause there before we move on to the next part to see if there's any questions. Uh, there's been no questions in the chat box, so. All right. No. Uh, give it 10 more seconds and then we'll move on. Okay. Uh, so oh, wait. Last, last second question. Does location affect response to a drug? Uh, just to clarify, do you mean the, the route of administration? So oral versus inhalational versus uh, uh, you know, injection? Is that what you're asking? Um, if they're used to taking a drug in X dose at home, will that same dose affect them differently at a festival? Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Uh, so at a basic level, if somebody's used to taking a specific drug, um, that's what's called tolerance. So it depends on the specific drug you're talking about. So if you're, let's say, talking about opioids, um, then people develop a specific tolerance to them. Certain drugs you don't develop tolerance to. Um, their body's specific response is gonna be the same for the most part, depend, uh, regardless of which location they're at. Uh, 
but there's a number of factors that would potentially complicate that answer, including, you know, co-ingestions, uh, the environmental circumstances. Uh, is it an extremely hot day and they're going to be complicated potentially by other heat illnesses or heat stroke that would have made them using, co let's say, cocaine at a music festival much different than them using cocaine at home, uh, for example. So, uh, yes, there can be a difference, definitely a different response uh, in different locations, um, but uh, at a base level, your body would respond to it somewhat in a similar manner. Yeah. Someone asks, where does the placebo effect come in? <laughs> um, interesting and pretty complicated question. Uh, so we usually talk about the placebo effect more in terms of uh, therapeutics, so treatments, as opposed to, let's say, recreational or illicit drug use. Um, maybe I'm gonna let you re-ask that question because I just want to make sure I understand what you want. Maybe we can do it towards the end because it's a placebo effect is, is fairly complicated and I'm not sure whether you're asking in, uh, you know, in the context of our treatments for specific toxins or, or just in people actually using the drugs themselves. So, um, here's that response. Was that another question or was that a response? Uh, the person who asked the question says, okay. And then Mike, um, my audio is okay. So it might be on your end. <laughs> uh, can you hear me okay, Anna? Yeah, someone was asking if anyone else is having trouble with audio, but I, I'm thinking it's on their end. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. Otherwise, no more questions at the moment. Okay, perfect. Great, so we'll go on from there. And uh, to that person, please feel free to um, ask me that question at the end. I'm happy to chat about placebo as well. Uh, so we'll get into some of the basic management strategies now, just uh, in very general terms. I think it's a kind of a useful thing to understand what decision-making we go through in terms of general management for tox patients. And then we'll get into the specifics for um, uh, specific toxins as we go on. So the majority of managing tox patients actually isn't very interesting. Um, it's basically just what we call supportive care. And we're all really good at this, um, though I think the term can be kind of vague sometimes, um, especially for patients that are more critically ill. In simplest terms, supportive care basically just means supporting the patient's own organs in order to the, allow them time to clear the toxin and recover on their own. So we're not providing any directed therapy towards giving an antidote or trying to get rid of the toxin or prevent it from being absorbed. Uh, we're just supporting their body and allowing it to clear the toxin on its own. Um, this can be thought of typically using a, you know, a common memory tool, just ABCs. Um, but we'll go with a slight variation for tox. So we'll use uh, A, B, C, D, D, E, A. Um, so this is for airway. Breathing, circulation, uh, our standard. Disability, which uh, refers to the nervous system, brain, and peripheral nerves. Decontamination, elimination, and antidotes. So we'll go through those individually. Uh, so A is for airway. Uh, we all know this well. Um, this is going to vary depending, again, on your scope scope of practice and the patient's clinical presentation. So uh, patients may require simple airway interventions such as, such as a three-quarter prone position, they may require an oral airway or even as so far as uh, endotracheal intubation if you have the appropriate setting for the, and personnel for that. B uh, kind of goes along with A, it's for breathing. Um, patients may require supplemental oxygen because they're not breathing adequately in terms of their uh, ventilation, or they might require it for another reason. Perhaps they have uh, an inhalational injury or they aspirated um, as a result of being unable to maintain their airway so we can support their breathing. Um, and again, that could be as simple as nasal prong oxygen all the way to mechanical ventilation. C is for circulation, as you know, so hemodynamics, which is a combination of uh, heart rate, blood pressure, perfusion uh, markers, 
these are monitored and managed. So these, this could be anything from as simple as checking a carotid pulse and feeling the patient's skin to invasive monitoring techniques like arterial blood pressure monitoring on the opposite end. Um, this basically just ensures that vital organs like the heart, brain, and kidneys receive the blood flow that they need. Uh, D is for disability or the neurologic effects that we're seeing from the toxin. Uh, many toxins will affect the brain uh, and altered mentation as well as seizures are common symptoms of various toxins. Uh, we, you know, uh, fairly simply do assessments like our Glasgow Coma Scale, um, but this can again range as complicated as electroencephalograms or EEGs to assess for seizures and interventions such as um, uh, induced coma for resting the brain or anti-seizure medications. One of the most common types of medications that we use, and we'll see this later on as we discuss specific medications, is the class of benzodiazepines. So this includes medications like lorazepam, also known as Ativan, midazolam, also known as Versed, and diazepam, also known as Valium. Um, it's often said that uh, benzodiazepines are the universal antidote in toxicology, and they can be given for just about anything. Now getting into the talk specifics. So the second D is for decontamination. So the first thing we consider when dealing with a tox exposure after our initial, initial history, physical examination, and risk assessment is whether we need to decontaminate. This means specifically removing any further toxin from outside the body. So when I say that, I mean it hasn't been absorbed yet. So that would include the skin, the lungs, the GI tract, so it hasn't actually gone and been absorbed into the bloodstream or into the uh, internal organs. And that prevents it from causing any further damage before we go, before the, uh, before we go forward. So there's many, many ways of doing this that have been proposed over the years. And the use of decontamination is very controversial. It depends a lot on the site of exposure and the specific toxin. Uh, for example, it's almost universally recommended that for any eye or skin exposure to toxin, toxins, we irrigate with large amounts of clean water or saline, basic first aid. Conversely, it's almost impossible to decontaminate the lungs effectively from a toxic exposure, and so that just generally isn't done. Uh, gastrointestinal decontamination is the, probably the most controversial of all of these um, uh, methods. Uh, and I'm just going to touch on a few of these here just so you're aware of them. Um, and I'm happy to talk about any of these more at the end. Um, none of these, outside of the use of water for skin or eye exposure, should be used outside of the direction of an experienced medical person um, as they can all potentially cause serious harm. So one of those common ones we see is called activated charcoal. Um, it's very, very commonly used in toxicology to treat ingestions. Um, it's used for its adsorbent properties. So that's different than absorbent. And something that adsorbs, it has the toxin uh, stick to it, as opposed to something when it's absorbed, it gets um, uh, amalgamated into that uh, property. So a sponge absorbs, um, but a magnet, for example, would absorb, so it sticks to it. Um, we typically uh, use activated charcoal for a number of different toxins. Uh, there are a few that it doesn't work for, but it's fairly broad. Um, and we typically use it very early on after ingestion. So the first one to two hours, although this is being stretched more recently in the literature. Um, the reason for the one to two hour time frame is that usually the substance is passed into the, from the stomach through the pylorus and then into the intestines by that time point, and it's already theoretically been absorbed to a significant extent, and then we have the risks of activated charcoal without as much of a benefit. Um, we don't universally use it because it can be dangerous if the patient vomits or aspirates it. So we need to be very careful with it in patients who have any altered level of consciousness or who are at risk of seizure. Um, it's also, which is the one on the right, marketed 
fairly aggressively as a health product for detox regimens, though there's no evidence for its efficacy in these settings that I'm aware of. Um, you can use it both as a single dose as well as as re repeated doses of charcoal. Uh, another one that's was used a lot more uh, pr uh, previously and has really kind of gone out of favor over the last 10 years or so is called gastric lavage. So this is when you used to hear about people going to the ER and getting their stomach pumped for drinking too much alcohol. Um, this is basically where we stick a large, large, large tube, um, either orally or nasally, typically, this one does show it nasally, but typically it's orally, um, into the stomach and you pump fluids in and then you suck everything out. Pump fluids in and suck everything out. And you're just trying to get as much of that toxin diluted and then removed from the stomach before it gets absorbed as possible. It's not used anymore for a number of reasons. It's uh, typically very high risk for aspiration and um, uh, patients typically don't, aren't maintaining their airway fairly well when this, uh, when this is used. Um, most pills as well, when we wanna use this, are too large to be removed by this technique. And a lot of toxins have effective antidotes or other therapies, so it's not really worth the, worth the risk a lot of the time. Another method that's somewhat similar to this, although different, is called whole bowel irrigation. So this is different than uh, what you'll often see in uh, you know, naturopathy or, or other interesting um, treatment regimens uh, like colonic hydrotherapy or cleanses. Um, in, as a medical procedure, a whole bowel irrigation is when there's a uh, tube inserted, more typically nasally for this one, uh, into the stomach, and we pump really, really large volumes of a laxative, typically Restorlax, also known as PEG3350, um, in volumes anywhere from one to two liters an hour of that um, uh, medication. So this is basically what you'd use for a colonoscopy prep. Um, and it theoretically washes all that toxin through the bowels and out of the patient before it can be absorbed. Um, this is another technique that's rarely used anymore uh, outside of large ingestions of slowly absorbing pills that are very toxic uh, and don't have any other treatments. So I had a patient uh, a week and a half ago that ingested uh, a large um, lethal dose of a medication called diltiazem, which is a calcium channel blocker or a, a blood pressure and um, heart rate medication. Uh, and so we started this on him. Um, he unfortunately passed away uh, for other reasons related to the ingestion, but um, it is still used. There are a number of other ways that are touted for removing toxins from the body, um, anything from bloodletting to Ipecac. Uh, the bottom line for most of these is that they should not be used again, except under direction of a medical provider, and ideally under the uh, direction of a toxicologist, so at the sea poison control. Um, a lot of these, like in the ER, we don't use unless it's at the direction of a, a toxicologist. All right, the next letter, E, is for elimination. Uh, elimination is the process by which we remove toxins from the body. Um, there's two major ways that you do this in your body, um, although there are a number of other minor ways. Typically, it's through the liver and the biliary system, so that's the, the bile ducts and the gallbladder, um, which empties into the intestines, or uh, just through the kidneys. Uh, the majority of toxins are removed by the kidneys, and most of the time, all we need to do is just provide supportive care to allow the kidneys enough time and enough blood flow to be able to do their jobs. Uh, sometimes we apply treatments, such as changing the acidity of the blood or the urine, in order to allow the kidneys to do their job better with specific toxins. Um, a way of eliminating with uh, activated charcoal is through something called multi-dose activated charcoal. So this goes to not the kidneys, but the biliary side of things. So in your liver, you have production of bile, which helps you normally digest foods, uh, specifically fatty foods, but you also excrete toxins out into the bile. Those toxins then go into the intestines, where some of them is excrete, excreted uh, through the feces, but some of it can be reabsorbed. So what we do is we give people multiple doses of charcoal that go into their intestines, and it adsorbs that toxin and prevents it from getting recirculated back into 
um, the patient's body. So it reduces the amount of toxicity in that way. Uh, another way that's extremely effective for elimination is through hemodialysis. So this has become a mainstay of toxicologic treatment for certain overdoses. Um, dialysis, for those not familiar with it, is the process by which blood is removed from the body, uh, passed through a machine, a dialysis machine, and then toxins are removed using a special membrane which only allows certain molecules to pass through. So the toxin passes through and can't get back into the blood uh, and then it returns the rest of the uh, blood to the body. Not all toxins can be dialyzed, but for those toxins that can be dialyzed, this can be life-saving. Okay, any questions on that before I go to the next section? Yeah, there were a couple questions. The most recent one uh, is, what about uh, treatment for punctures with cytotoxic substances? I thought letting it bleed free is good for irrigating the puncture. Yeah, so I'm guessing, I'm, I'm assuming you're probably getting towards like spider bites and, and snake envenomations. Uh, that depends a lot on the specific um, animal that you're talking about. Uh, so for the most part, if you've heard about it in a first aid textbook, it's probably wrong. Uh, the easiest answer to all of it is to do nothing and get the patient to medical care as soon as possible because most of the times those specific interventions like applying ice, putting a tourniquet on, uh, sucking out the venom, everything except for just irrigating the wound and doing basic wound care, most of the time those will cause more harm than good. Uh, so for the most part, do nothing, keep the patient as still as possible and get them to, um, get them to medical care. Uh, let me know if you weren't talking about Envenomations, and I'm happy to address another point if you had another question. All right, um, and the second question is: Would toxins, would toxins or substances result in metabolic uh, or respiratory acidosis slash alkalosis? Should that be in our differential if we see someone who is tachypnic? Yeah, absolutely. It's a really, that's a really good point. So uh, we'll get into it a little bit more. And I didn't focus much on the metabolic components because I don't think it's particularly relevant for us uh, on the front lines, but you're absolutely right. So when you see somebody who is tachypnic or has a, uh, a fast respiratory rate, typically we think about processes that relate to the lungs, sometimes relating to the heart as well. Uh, but those are usually the things that are, are front of mind, but you're absolutely right. So in order to balance the acidity of the blood, your body, if you have what's called a metabolic acidosis, so basically in simple terms, your body is producing too much acid for various reasons. That could be because of a toxin, like you said, um, your body tries to balance it out. And so the way it does that is it removes carbon dioxide from the blood by breathing faster. When you remove that carbon dioxide, it brings uh, the pH back into a, a more neutral balance. Um, so yes, that should be on, that isn't absolutely in the differential of somebody who's tachypnic, but um, you know, typically uh, not super relevant for most of the uh, toxidromes that we're gonna see at a music festival or, or event or an event medicine. That'd be more for somebody who is, you know, they've overdosed on aspirin or Tylenol or uh, a toxic alcohol like ethylene glycol or methanol. Those would be common ones that would cause you know, uh, severe metabolic acidosis, heavy metals like iron, lead, um, and a few other ones. Yeah, good question. Um, Austin, who asked the question says, awesome, thank you. No problem. Any other questions, Anna? Uh, none at the moment, no. Cool, awesome. Really good questions, guys. Keep it up. I'm uh, always happy to stop. Okay, so now that we've kind of gone through our A, B, C, D, D, E, A's, uh, we're just going to chat about the last part of that, uh, which is the last A, which is the antidotes. Um, so the word antidote is thrown around quite a bit. Um, it is specifically meant as an intervention, typically a medication, that directly counteracts the action of a drug. 
So there are many different antidotes that we use, and I'm just gonna discuss a few of the more common ones here as a taster, uh, but I'm happy to chat about any if you've heard about them and have questions. Um, so the first one, which I mentioned earlier, is uh, benzodiazepines. And I, I would argue this probably doesn't fit the definition I just gave you of an antidote, but we use it for a lot of toxicities because it's very effective in treating uh, and treating them. Specifically, anything really to do with agitation or stimulant overdose, um, even anticholinergic toxicity, the benzodiazepines are very, very effective. So benzodiazepines uh, are medications that basically bring down the level of excitability in your brain and nerves. So they just suppress everything. They're sedatives. Um, so the, the patients we're using this on, as I said, is patients with elevated autonomic activity, so high heart rate, high blood pressure, sweaty, tech, um, uh, tachypnic, and this just brings everything down. Uh, they act through a receptor called GABA, which we can talk about more later if you want to, um, and it's some interesting physiology. The second uh, antidote, again, this is typically to treat the, uh, a side effect or an additional effect of some toxins, is dextrose. So dextrose is uh, glucose, um, and there are different forms of dextrose that we use. This is D50, there's D25, D10, D5, and they come in different solutions. Um, the D just means dextrose. Uh, it's typically D5W, D10W, although there are normal saline solutions as well for it. Uh, we'll often use this empirically, uh, meaning uh, on spec for patients that are found down and that we can't get a glucose for. Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with just you know, giving buccal uh, glucose as well, which works works just fine and does a good job. Um, but if you do have IV access, if you have personnel there who can do that, then intravenous dextrose works, uh, works very quickly. Um, so toxins that will cause low glucose, um, insulin, uh, again, not something you're probably gonna see very often, um, although you might see it in a, in a diabetic who comes in and they, uh, you know, took their insulin and then uh, did a lot of activity. Maybe they're at a, a sports event or uh, didn't eat at all throughout the day. Uh, another class of diabetes medications known as sulfonylureas are very well known for causing fairly significant hypoglycemia. Uh, some medications indirectly, uh, alcohol, opioids, will cause low glucose. Um, so this should be checked early in any patient with an altered level of consciousness. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you, if not all of you, are now familiar with Narcan or Naloxone. Um, so Naloxone is an opioid antidote. It is a opioid mu receptor um, blocker or antagonist is the fancy word. So it counteracts the effects of uh, essentially all opioids, um, though some opioids are more potent than others and some will require massive doses of uh, naloxone in order to counteract them. Um, this is again a fairly common empiric or um, uh, on spec antidote that we'll use for people with decreased level of consciousness and low respirate for small peoples, which we'll get into in a second. Uh, sodium bicarbonate, or bicarb for short, is a fairly, <laughs> fairly simple uh, antidote that we use for certain types of toxins. Um, it's used in two ways, for the sodium component as well as for the bicarbonate component. So what sodium does is it counteracts toxins that affect sodium channels. We're not gonna get into any of those today. Uh, we can at the end if you want to, um, but it has a very high concentration of sodium. So certain medications, specifically heart medications, um, can block those sodium channels, which can make people very sick. So this counteracts it. Uh, we also use it sometimes for the bicarbonate component, which makes your blood more uh, alkalemic or basic, um, and that can help to excrete certain toxins. Uh, atropine uh, is not commonly uh, used regularly uh, for tox purposes in North America because the reason we use it, which is a cholinergic toxicity that we talked about earlier, so that's serum gas, certain pesticides, uh, it's just, it just doesn't come up all that often in North America. So it's an 
Uh, atropine is an anticholinergic medication, and very potent. So it comes from the Atropa belladonna plant or deadly nightshade, although it's synthetically made now. Um, and it does the opposite of rest and digest. So it's your um, almost fight or flight response, like we talked about earlier. Um, and lastly, just kind of an interesting one, if all of this fails and the patient is going down the tubes, then uh, sometimes we'll put people on a form of heart-lung bypass uh, known as ECMO or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Um, so essentially what this is, is, uh, is where we take blood out of, a patient, out of the patient, uh, typically through the femoral vein in the groin, uh, sometimes through the internal jugular vein in the neck. And we take that blood, we spit it through a pump, uh, we spit it through an oxygenator to uh, restore the blood uh, levels of oxygen. And we scrub out some carbon dioxide, so it essentially acts like the lungs. Sometimes we run it through a dialysis machine at the same time, sometimes we add medications, and then we pump it right back on in. Um, there's two forms of this. One can support the lungs only, so it uh, goes out of a vein and then back into a vein, so it just supports oxygenation and removal of carbon dioxide. And then the other uh, form, which uh, supports both the lungs and the heart, uh, puts the blood back into an artery and pumps the blood around uh, the systemic circulation to all your vital organs. Uh, so that's known as ECMO, and that's kind of a very last ditch for certain types of toxins. Okay, I'm gonna do one more pause before we get to the cases and the specific toxins, if there's any questions. Uh, there's one question that came up and that's from Mike and he's asking, do benzodiazepines have any effect on respiration? Yeah, good question. Um, so as with most things in toxicology, depends on the specific medication and depends on the dose and depends on the co-ingestants. Uh, so specifically, um, most benzodiazepines, while it is in their list of adverse effects or complications, uh, don't tend to cause a lot of respiratory depression by themselves. You can give decent doses of midazolam or Ativan, uh, and people tend not to have their respiratory rate go down. When they do have the respiratory rate go down is when you combine them with opioids or you combine them with another medication that suppresses the respiration, but typically opioids. Um, and then it can, they synergize and they can become fairly potent uh, respiratory depressants at that point. You have to be fairly careful. So we run into that, you know, commonly in the well, previously more commonly in the ER when we used to use a lot of um, morphine and midazolam for sedating people for painful procedures in the emergency department. Uh, we don't tend to use those medications together as much anymore uh, because we have the better medications. Um, you'll also see this in some opioid overdoses in the community. There, um, the last year or two, there's been a lot of benzodiazepines kind of circulating in um, fentanyl, heroin, uh, uh, stocks uh, out on the street. And so when we have patients that aren't completely responding to naloxone, often we find that those are uh, contaminated with ultra potent benzodiazepines. Okay. Uh, Kyra asks, is more blood volume required for ECMO? Uh, good question. Good question. Um, so it, Again, as with most of these questions, it's going to be, a, it depends. Uh, mostly it depends on what kind of ECMO you're running. So if you are running the uh, mostly lung support ECMO, which we call veno-venous, just meaning where it goes in, where it goes out, um, that tends to, uh, it, and it depends on how much you're supporting their lungs. So if you need to Basically, let's say they they say they have COVID and they have basically no lung function left. Um, that person is going to require a lot of flow through the circuit, and therefore you might add some more blood back in to prevent their um, their uh, blood circulation from kind of getting emptied out. Um, it's more so that the machine runs smoothly than anything, because if you have a low blood volume, it kind of, it tries to suck blood out of you 
but your blood vessel collapses. And so the machine stops working properly. It's kind of like a pump where it's up against something else and you can't actually um, suck into the pump. So that's, that's more the reason why we would add extra blood volume with the uh, heart lung um, transition. Again, it depends on how much support, but typically uh, you don't need as much volume for that circuit. Yeah, but good question. Really complicated. <laughs> Cool. Uh, those are all the questions that have popped up now. Awesome. All right. Let me go to the next slide. Okay. So we're going to go into some cases. Um, I'm going to give it a minute for people to just consider each case as we go. Feel free to, um, if you want to chime in, I, I definitely appreciate that. It's kind of nice to know if people are on the same page with the presentation. So letting me know what you think of each case and if you have any ideas of what each one might be. They're not complicated. They're not trick questions. Um, so case number one is a 24-year-old lady uh, who was at a music festival. She was found down behind a stage, uh, non-responsive to pain. Uh, she had track marks on her arms. She has Pinpoint pupils, uh, a slow respiratory rate of six. Uh, she is hypoxic at 78% on room air prior to oxygen. She's got a bit of a soft blood pressure, 90 and 40. Uh, her heart rate is low, temperature is relatively normal, and she's got clammy skin. So I'm sure most people probably know this, but what did she take? Uh, you guys can unmute yourself if you wanna chime in. Otherwise, type it in the group chat here. Uh, so we have three for opioids. <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. Four yeah, for so opioids. Love it. So thanks for participating. appreciate it. So opioids. Um, so these are one of the easier ones to recognize, um, partially because there's been a lot of publicity in the area. And so it's, uh, you know, tends to be kind of front of mind for a lot of people. So Opioids in general are a really, really broad class. I'm specifically talking here about the combination of heroin and fentanyl. Um, so previously this used to just be heroin. Now, essentially in our, our drug supply, uh, for the most part, you can assume that heroin has fentanyl in it. There's almost no pure heroin anymore, unless you're talking about heroin that you're getting from supervised injection site from government stores, which is true diacetylmorphine, which is true heroin, there are certain supervised programs for that. Um, there are tons of other opioids, prescription pills, inject injection solutions that um, we're not going to talk about. In terms of heroin specifically, so uh, it goes by a number of different names colloquially uh, and on the streets so of dope, smack, down, snow, um, dozens of others. It was originally um, extracted from poppy plants, well still still is, um, although there are synthetic opioids, including fentanyl, uh, carfentanyl, um, sufentanyl, remifentanyl, all sorts of different uh, very, very potent opioids that are synthetic. Um, it's typically either smoked uh, or injected, but again, the prescription medications are very commonly ingested. Um, and misuse of prescription opioids is very, very common, especially among younger people, although it, it spans all, uh, all age categories. Um, so its drug effect is influenced a lot by the dose uh, tolerance, like we were talking about earlier with that, um, with that question. Uh, and what type of metabolites it has. So what does it break down to? And does that metabolite still have an effect? The main effects of opioids are going to be a decreased level of consciousness, so sedation, um, potentially leading to coma, seizures, and death. Although the seizures and death, or coma, seizures, death, they're typically more a result of the uh, inadequate ventilation. So Patients also get decreased shallow respirations um, that can lead to hypoxia um, and end organ uh, malperfusion. 
They also get pinpoint pupils, which happens for a very complicated uh, reason in the central nervous system that we won't get into. It's important to rec recognize that pin, uh, pinpoint pupils uh, are useful finding, but just because somebody has normal pupils doesn't mean they uh, can't have an, um, an opioid on board. It depends on what else they've taken. For example, uh, somebody might have taken a speedball, which is a combination of typically cocaine and uh, co cocaine and heroin. And so they may have mid-range or even large people despite having taken a very, very large dose of an opioid. Um, I had a patient uh, last year who was getting ready to discharge and then he went and took a speedball and in the bathroom came back out extremely, extremely agitated. We gave him some sedation. Uh, so this goes to the other question of regarding benzodiazepines. Uh, so we gave him some benzos just to calm him down and the combination of the benzos plus the opioids that he had on board uh, made him go apneic or without without any respiration. So, so he had to be intubated um, as a result of that. Um, the antidote for this one uh, is naloxone, as we know, um, and otherwise it's general supportive care, so good ABCs. Um, no real uh, decontamination or elimination strategies, it's primarily just the antidote for it, and sometimes you require an ongoing infusion of naloxone uh, to treat it. Uh, all right, case two. So 19-year-old guy, he has an unsteady gait, uh, was found over by the beer garden, uh, confused with slurred speech. Oh, sorry, no, he was found in the bathroom, uh, covered in vomit. Uh, he has uh, you know, normal to low blood pressure, a little bit of tachycardia. He's a bit cold, uh, 35.5, and he feels really cold to touch. His rests are normal, his glucose is a bit low, and he's... Uh, fairly sweaty. So uh, I won't ask with this one because the picture is fairly obvious. This is uh, alcohol intoxication. So alcohol falls into the category of uh, sedatives uh, or uh, CNS depressant medications. It's, uh, I think we're all probably fairly familiar with this, uh, potentially personally or just in general socially or at events. Um, but it initially provides a sense of heightened mood, euphoria, inattention, and disinhibited behavior. And then at a certain dose, depending on the person, and that's fairly variable depending on your genetics and your uh, previous tolerance, you transition more into a altered, decreased LOC with slurred speech uh, ataxia, which is an unstable um, uh, gait, unstable walking, or inability to coordinate yourself, uh, and then potentially even to yes, coma, respiratory depression, loss of airway reflexes, and death. The vitals you kind of saw, you, they may have a little bit of a low blood pressure, a little bit of high heart rate, often from vomiting and volume depletion. It's very common to have a low temperature with these patients. They very commonly get hypothermic. Um, they inappropriately vasodilate, so their skin um, blood vessels don't appropriately constrict. And so this is the person that might come in with a extreme hypothermia because they were out drinking in the winter and they were found in a snowbank and their body didn't respond as it normally should by constricting blood vessels because they had alcohol on board already. From a metabolic perspective, they uh, alcoholics have very poor sugar, supply, sugar supplies in their liver and so they can very easily be predisposed to low glucose but also alcohol lowers your glucose level and then a number of other electrolyte abnormalities. And it really depends on which alcohol. I'm talking about ethyl alcohol, which is our standard um, ethanol in most drinks, but there are a number of other toxic alcohols which cause very different effects. Um, and we can talk about those if you guys want to later. Next case. So this is a 27-year-old gentleman who was found wandering the streets, uh, fairly agitated and combative. Uh, he was found sweaty, hot, uh, with hypertension, tachycardia and hyperthermia, so a fairly elevated temperature. Um, he has normal rest rate, maybe a little bit up, uh, normal oxygen saturations, and uh, his glucose is a bit elevated. His pupils are very large, and you otherwise note, note that he has the scabbing you can see there, as well as very, very poor dentition. Uh, so what do we think this guy took? Uh 
all answers are for meth. Excellent, excellent. So people have watched Breaking Bad. Perfect. Um, so methamphetamines. Uh, so this falls into the category, uh, the toxidrome category of sympathomimetics. So when we say sympathomimetics, just to break it down, it's mimicking the sympathetic nervous system. Uh, so it's going to be your fight or flight response. You can also generally refer to them as stimulants. So specifically talking about meth, um, this is casually known under a number of different names, but speed, ice, crystal, glass, depending on which type of meth you're talking about. Um, it can be smoked, snorted, ingested, um, and I didn't put intravenous on there, but it can be as well. Um, typically, in like small doses, this will provide large amounts of energy, wakefulness, um, uh, and uh, you know, uh, very gets people very, very ramped up. So they get that sympathetic surge, so high heart rate, high blood pressure, and probably most importantly is that elevated temperature, because that can be one of the more dangerous components of methamphetamine toxicities. These patients are predisposed to arrhythmias, so um, abnormal heart rhythms that can be uh, quite serious, although as we'll talk about in a sec, cocaine is typically uh, more, more commonly associated with it. On the long term, this can cause chronic psychiatric um, uh, problems, uh, as well as acutely patients it's a very common problem to have people come in with substance-induced psychosis. So typically they'll be using meth for days on end, no sleep, just going, 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 repeated doses, and then they often come in hallucinating, hearing voices, crash, we keep them for a couple of days, and then they're discharged in a few days, totally lucid and go back to whatever they were doing before. So a very, very common situation. Uh, the dental problems, as I mentioned before. Another very common stimulant is cocaine, um, known as coke, snow, flake, blow, um, uh, among a number of other uh, names. It's very, very addictive. Uh, it can be snorted, ingested, again, I forgot to put injected. Um, one variant of cocaine that we often hear about is crack cocaine uh, or crack. The difference between cocaine and crack cocaine is it's uh, the alkali form of cocaine that's been designed so that it can be smoked. Um, so it's a little bit easier in terms of production and utilization. Uh, fairly similar to meth, um, although some, some nuances. They tend to get more abnormal heart rhythms, more arrhythmias, and they tend to get more vascular complications. So they can get heart attacks both acutely uh, when they're using it because of what's called vasospasm, where the cocaine makes the vessels clamp down so hard that your heart gets no blood supply. Uh, similarly, it can happen in strokes. Uh, you can get vasospastic strokes with cocaine. But cocaine also is um, a significant irritant to the blood vessels um, and accelerates the progression of coronary artery disease uh, much faster than high blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes combined. So I've seen patients who are 26, 27 years old come in with a real heart attack because they've been using cocaine for the last 10 years. Um, so fairly serious problem. Uh, they can get seizures because of another property of cocaine. I mentioned sodium channels earlier, but this, medic this, uh, this drug affects sodium channels, and so they can get seizures because of that. Uh, the treatment for them, so supportive care. Uh, one of the important things is these patients can require aggressive cooling, so the temperature is really important. In addition to the heart attacks and arrhythmias, so abnormal heart rhythms, the hyperthermia is commonly what, killed, what kills these patients. Your brain can only survive for so long a period of time um, above the range of 40, 41 degrees Celsius assuming that it's not because of a fever. So there's a difference, I don't know if I said this earlier, between fever, which is your body's appropriate response to, say, an infection, and hyperthermia, which is an inappropriate response to, let's say, a drug, uh, or to being getting heat stroke. If you have hyperthermia, your body hasn't adapted to being, uh, and it's not ready for that high temperature, and you can basically roast your brain, roast your organs. Um, so aggressive cooling is very important for those above 40 degrees Celsius. Uh, benzodiazepines help to bring that 
sympathetic response down at, high, at fight or flight response. And then we can also give specific treatments in specific situations. So medications like nitroglycerin, which uh, open up blood vessels. Phentolamine opens up blood vessels. Bicarbonate is a sodium medication to treat that sodium uh, toxicity. Uh, I'm just going to stop there if anybody has any questions on those three cases. So we did uh, uh, opioids, uh, amphetamines and stimulants, and then alcohol. Um, so there's a question from Mike and he asks, what is the mechanism of decreased potassium from alcohol? Yeah, good question. So um, can be a number of different things. So chronic malnutrition in a lot of these patients causes them to have uh, hypokalemia or, or low potassium. Um, acutely though, in the short term, they can have a combination of vomiting and diarrhea. Um, chronic vomiting or ongoing vomiting is uh, not necessarily chronic vomiting, but chron um, vomiting in the acute setting with alcoholism. Uh, if you have repeated episodes, you lose a bunch of acid. When you lose a bunch of acid, your body um, becomes uh, alkalemic or has a more basic um, acidity to it. When your body has a basic acidity, your cells have a shift of sodium and potassium and your potassium uh, level in the blood goes down. So there's, those are kind of the more common mechanisms. There's a few other ones, but those would be the, the main ones. Okay. Uh, the next question is, are there any toxins that can mimic psychosis or schizophrenia or perhaps even hide in your body's system? Um, ab absolutely. So like we talked about earlier, uh, with very, very commonly the stimulants. So methamphetamines probably is the, is the best example to use. Uh, they can certainly mimic, um, so just as a clarification, psychosis is a term that we use to describe a number of different disorders where people have, uh, abnormal thought processes or abnormal thoughts associated with delusions so an abnormal perception of the world or hallucination or sorry delusions uh, sorry getting mixed up hallucinations being an abnormal perception of the world so either hearing things that other people don't hear or seeing things other people don't see or delusions which is a fixed belief that something is real so my neighbor is spying on me when there's absolutely zero chance my neighbor is spying on me. So that's psychosis. Um, and then psychosis is a symptom of a disease. So uh, for example, schizophrenia has psychosis. Some forms of mood disorders, so types of depression have psychosis. Bipolar disorder can have psychosis. So all of those are um, in that category. So as you said, yes, many different, mostly stimulants can mimic psychosis and many other conditions um, can mimic psychosis. So that's what, that's what in the ER, for example, that's our main job is to figure out is, does this person have a non-psychiatric reason that they're psychotic um, before they go to a psychiatrist who may not pick that up. And was it, what was the second part of the question? Um, the second part asks, or perhaps even hide in your body's system? Uh, I'm not sure about that part. Maybe we can clarify that later. Yeah. Um, the person who asked that question, do you maybe want to elaborate on that last, last sentence there? Um, that's all the questions for now. If I don't hear a clarification on that one, I'll just move on and we can always talk about it later. Okay, uh, so next case, a uh, 34-year-old gentleman, uh, he was found unconscious, but his friends say that uh, he went off into his tent and came out quite agitated, appeared to be having some hallucinations. Uh, he was found with some white powder around his nose. His blood pressure is a bit high, heart rate's a bit high, temperature's a little bit up, um, respiration's fairly normal, his skin's warm, his pupils are equal, reactive, but he has nystagmus. Does anybody know what nystagmus is? Put you on the spot. <laughs> Somebody wants to throw into an answer into the chat. 
uh, inability to keep your eye focused, lateral beating of eyes. Good, yeah, exactly. That's awesome. I'll show you what it means. So this. So give it a sec. So that's nystagmus. So it's an involuntary movement of your eye. Like the person said, sometimes it can be lateral, but it can be in all sorts of different directions depending on what's causing it. But you can think of it just the eyes twitching. Uh, that's what nystagmus is. And does anybody know what might cause that in the context of this patient? There's two guesses for ketamine. Nice. Okay, I guess give it a little bit of a a little bit of a hint. Um, so ketamine. Uh, ketamine is a really, really interesting drug. We use it a lot uh, in the ER. Um, it's what's called a dissociative anesthetic. Um, it acts by a receptor called the NMDA receptor, not the MDMA receptor, the NMDA receptor. Um, and it basically separates your body from your mind. Uh, so physically, you can do pretty much anything to somebody who's dissociated, and they will remember or, and feel nothing. Um, they may actually have some responses to it or appear like they're somewhat awake, um, but they have zero recollection and zero ability to respond appropriately. Uh, it's also a hallucinogen as well. Um, so names for this one, Special K, Kit Kat, Super K are fairly common. It's uh, originally you know, kind of um, thought of as a horse tranquilizer, although it's been in use in medicine forever. And it's probably one of the most used medications internationally. Uh, many, many places around the world use ketamine as a sole anesthetic for surgeries by itself. No airway management, no anesthesiologist. The surgeon gives somebody a shot of ketamine in their arm, no IV, and then they repeat the dose that they need to. And they go and operate on their appendix or whatever it is they're doing. Um, so very, very safe drug. Um, it does have some sympathomimetic effects. Uh, it can cause agitation and it can cause those hallucinations and psychiatric effects as well, although not typically the psychosis like a meth, uh, somebody who uses meth would. Uh, treatment for these patients is typically conservative, just supportive care, and if they're really agitated, sedation uh, for these patients with benzodiazepines. Uh, next case is a 25-year-old uh, lady who was found comatose with a GCS of three. Uh, she, was, she is maintaining her airway. Uh, she was found with a concerning presentation uh, without underwear over near one of the, some of the tents at a music festival. Uh, her friends were with her earlier and they said she only had one drink as far as they could tell and there was a creepy guy talking to her earlier on in the day. Um, she, as I said, is maintaining her airway, has a reasonable respiratory rate, uh, normal oxygen saturation, heart rate 70, blood pressure is fairly normal, normal temperature, and normal glucose. She's a bit, a bit clammy, but uh, otherwise unremarkable aside from her very altered level of consciousness. Uh, does anybody have an idea what this one might be? Uh, so there's a few comments here. There's some for GHB, there's some for Rohypnol. Perfect. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So it could be either one of those. So exactly right. Um, so GHB and rohypnol. Um, so GHB stands for gamma hydroxybutyrate and rohypnol is uh, flunitrazepam, which is basically a benzodiazepine, but it's a very potent benzodiazepine. Both of these are sedatives, but they're very, very potent amnestic agents, meaning they, they make it so that from the point you've taken it onwards, you have very little recollection of anything that happened. Uh, and they're, they can be very, very potent sedatives as well, specifically GHB. Um, they're both thought of as the date rape drug, um, de um, in a, depending on your, your, your social setting. Um, and, but they're also really, really commonly abused as uh, just intoxicants. So you can think of GHB essentially as, and rohypnol arguably, uh, as super alcohol. So people go around and they have bottle caps and they'll drink a half a cap or sometimes a cap of GHB. And that is essentially the same as six, seven, eight drinks of alcohol. Um, so very, very potent and 
Some people love it because they don't have to drink as much, but the risk is that you very easily can overdose on it. Um, so GHB typically comes in liquids or capsules, and then ropicnol is either pills, uh, powder, or tablets, depending on uh, how you get it. Um, GHB specifically is often known as liquid X to C, liquid X, scoop, um, or date rape, I mean. Um, as I said, very similar to alcohol. It's not detected by testing, unfortunately. Um, well, sorry, it can be detected, but only within about the first hour or so. Uh, and it results in a very deep coma. It's a, it's a very fascinating presentation if anybody's seen it before. Um, these patients come in with, like I said earlier, like I said in the presentation, uh, sometimes GCS of three. Um, not responding to any painful stimulus, but maintaining their airway, maintaining their airway reflexes, and maintaining uh, respiratory drive. They are also very prone to sudden rapid changes in level of consciousness. So they go zero to a hundred. Uh, they often need to be sedated and sometimes they actually need to be intubated, not for their coma, but for their severe agitation afterwards, um, or they're, they're preventatively intubated because of the concern regarding their agitation. Um, but some of them will just stay comatose. I remember a patient I had back at um, the Squamish Music Festival a number of years ago who we watched for five hours, essentially GCS three, and then he just woke up and he was fine and he went, up, went back to the party. Um, but certainly can be lethal um, depending on each person's response and what else they took. Okay, next case, I've uh, got a few more. I think there's eight total, and then that should leave us right at about an hour and a half and should hopefully have lots of time for questions or um, I'll stick around afterwards and we can chat if you guys want to. Uh, so case number six is a 38 year old lady. Uh, she is found hysterical crying um, by police officers after she called uh, 911 saying that she was dying, that people were out to get her. She's very anxious, uh, she's very scared, and she says she's tripping out. Um, blood pressure's a little high, heart rate's a little high, temperature's normal, respirate's a little bit high, uh, oxygen's fine and glucose is fine. She has mild dilation of her pupils. Um, any thoughts on this one? Uh, so there's a few different thoughts. Uh, we've got LSD, magic mushrooms, PCP. Boom. boom uh, lots boom. of people saying acid. Yeah, exactly. Psilocybin. So, so, yeah, you. All of those are bang on. So uh, this is, just, I mean, meant to be LSD, but very easily could be magic mushrooms. Uh, could be psilocybin as well. You're all exactly right. Um, so just starting with LSD. So this is lysergic acid uh, diethylamide, uh, if you want the fun name. Uh, it's a hallucinogen primarily. Um, so this is very popular. Well, it's still used quite a bit, but it was very popular you know, in the uh, uh, 70s. Uh, 60s, 70s, uh, known as you said as acid, L, tabs, trips, and blotters. And the blotters are these little uh, tabs that people will put on their tongue. And they have a specific dose of LSD. Um, they also come in liquids as well. It's very, very potent. Um, and actually, interestingly, LSD has a some of the most research of any drug out there um, in terms of its safety profile and its uh, psychiatric or uh, psychedelic effects, I should say, not psychiatric necessarily. Um, and it's impressively one of the safest, if not the safest drug you could possibly take. There have been no reported deaths directly attributable to LSD um, uh, itself in the literature. Uh, the only deaths associated with LSD use are as a result of accidents or from confusion of patients while on the drug. Um, paranoia obviously is gonna put you in uh, a more dangerous situation as well. So these patients get an altered sensorium, they get significant euphoria, they get an out-of-body experience, they often get what's called synesthesia, which is a blending of senses. So you're, you know, you eat something and you see it, or you see the taste, or you hear something and you taste it. Um, they also get kind of that mild sympathomimetic effect as well. Um, psilocybin or um, uh, 
magic mushrooms is the kind of more uh, commonly used names or shrooms is another very potent hallucinogen uh, that's typically eaten or brewed uh, and again very very safe um, you, can get, you can get some nausea and vomiting along with it or drowsiness but most of the danger is from either the confusion from the drug or from accidentally ingesting the wrong mushroom uh, so most of these are commercially grown now and people have a reasonably safe source, but uh, many, many, many mushrooms are can be extremely toxic. And so uh, that's often where people go wrong is they try and pick their own magic mushrooms and they, they ingest the wrong one. Uh, these guys uh, are all just conservative uh, therapy. Uh, people said PCP as well. So PCP would fall into a similar category. It's very similar to ketamine. Um, but it has a little bit more on the hallucinogenic side of the effect. So it's a dissociative medication as well, just to cover that one. Okay, uh, second last case. Uh, so 18 year old guy, he had a rave, uh, he found you know, very, very euphoric, hugging and kissing everybody. He just says he loves everyone. Uh, very rapid pressured speech, he can't stop him talking. He looks, he's kind of confused though along with it. Super, super sweaty, uh, big pupils. He's grinding his teeth, just grinding, grinding, grinding um, until you put his suitor back in that's hanging around his neck. Um, he's got tachycardia, hypertension, and uh, hyperthermia. He also, interestingly, has stiff arms and legs along with it. So what did he take? And does anybody know what complication of using this drug he might have for bonus points uh so everyone is saying mdma ecstasy and then read comments is he dehydrated he probably is dehydrated uh, and that dehydration causes something else the second word is syndrome so can anybody guess the first <laughs> the first word <laughs> it has to do with the mechanism of this drug it's a bit of an advanced question, but I'm just uh, curious, curious if we have anybody who's heard of this before. Nav says EPS question mark. Austin asks serotonin syndrome. Nice, nice. Serotonin syndrome is bang on. Uh, EPS is an interesting one as well. Um, so EPS stands for extra pyramidal syndrome, um, uh, syndrome or extra pyramidal symptoms. Uh, tends to go along with more use of antipsychotic medications. Um, uh, the complication of those medications that would be more of this presentation is called something called uh, NMS uh, or neuroleptic malignant syndrome, which is a severe life-threatening reaction to those antipsychotic medications that appears very, very similar to this. Um, uh, just, just to kind of clarify that point. So yeah, serotonin syndrome, nice job whoever got that one and nice job everybody for getting uh, ecstasy and or MDMA. Uh, so uh, MDMA is a stimulant, uh, but it also acts on the serotonin receptors. So MDMA, again, long front name is methylene dioxymethamphetamine, um, and it kind of comes within a class of designer drugs. So designer drugs are basically where people keep changing the chemical structure slightly, so they have a somewhat similar effect, but previous under, under previous U.S. legislation, so U.S. Uh, DEA. Uh, legislation, they had to specifically name the chemical structure of every drug they wanted to outlaw. Um, and so they would create a new chemical structure and therefore it would no longer be illegal. They have since closed that loophole. And so basically if you're developing something with an intent to market it as a illicit substance, they now have a proactive um, set of legislation to prevent designer drug use uh, and design. Uh, they're out, but they're now marketing a lot of them as other products, like not, not for human use, uh, like cleaners or plant food. And so people order that and then use it uh, because they, they're kind of in the know. Um, anyways, back to MDMA. So uh, capsules, tablets, and powders, um, although you'll often see these little tabs that are fun and colorful and obviously very attractive to young people at parties. Um, sympathomimetic effects are the big one, uh, but it also... Um, increases emotion, so increased arousal, sexual behavior, disinhibition, just a sense of loving everything and a heightened sense of, uh, of emotion. Uh, they can get some of those complications like cocaine, like arrhythmias and MI, although not as common. That 
teeth grinding that I talked about is called bruxism. Um, and it's very common with this uh, medication. I'm not actually sure what the mechanism behind that is. So I'll have to look, I forgot to look that up. Um, but they'll just grind and grind and grind and grind their teeth. And uh, so that's why they, a lot of the people at raves wear, they have soothers so that they don't grind their teeth down um, inadvertently. And then two major complications just to be aware of for this, uh, because it's seen so often, are serotonin syndrome, which is uh, basically where your body has an excess of serotonin. And what happens is it's very similar to that presentation I was talking about with the really hot and bothered person who is hyperthermic. So they're too hot, they're high blood pressure, high heart rate, sweaty so very similar to fight or flight but they in addition to that have really really bad um, excitability of their central nervous system so what i mean by that is their reflexes and their tone are sky high and the reason that that's bad is that their brain is basically just like roasting from the serotonin and from the hyperthermia and it can result in permanent neurologic damage uh, seizures and death so it's fairly serious. So if you see somebody really, really, really stiff arms or reflexes that are just jumping off the table at you, uh, if their feet are just flapping or their hands are just flapping, uh, that can be potentially fairly concerning. Uh, these guys also get low sodium levels to the point where they can have seizures because of that. Uh, that's due to uh, a uh, hormone uh, misregulation due to the, the, the ecstasy, as well as they drink a ton of water when they're at the race. So they get basically water intoxication. Okay, last one. Uh, you got your medical rover team. They're coming back to the tent after a long night uh, and they're feeling super chill. They are requesting all the leftover snacks and they are chatting about the great music and they were chatting about how strong that incense was burning out there. So. I think this one's pretty obvious, but they might've gotten a little bit of the cannabis on board. Um, so marijuana, um, pot, dope, weed, bud, Mary Jane, hash, whatever you want to call it, uh, is a combination of uh, THC and CBD. I'm sure you guys uh, probably have read about this more than uh, other, um, other drugs because it's just so common now, especially with legalization. Um, so a number of different ways of using it and the effects are fairly well known. So euphoria, relaxation, um, good kind of mild sensory changes, enhanced senses, talkativeness, uh, sometimes you know, very, very significant relaxation and drowsiness, but not to the point of uh, negative effects. And people often get the, uh, uh, some respiratory problems due to smoking it. So especially if they have asthma or reactive airways and then paranoia is not uncommon. Uh, so, and sorry, just uh, supportive care for that one as well. Last slide, or second to last slide. Um, so all of this is fine and dandy, but uh, sometimes people mix pills. They take more than one thing at once. And once you've ingested or used multiple agents, uh, all bets are off and all you can do is do your best. Um, sometimes you have features of one, the other, or multiple at the same time, and it can be very, very difficult to predict. Uh, you also have a higher risk of adverse effects from mixing multiple drugs at the same time. So just to review things, uh, we went through today some of the anatomy and physiology of the autonomic nervous system. We chatted about the basics of uh, toxidromes and the basic approach to toxicology. Um, so the airway, breathing, circulation, disability, decontamination, elimination, and antidote approach. Uh, we've reviewed uh, the tox history and physical examination, as well as the basics of risk assessment. And then we chatted about some of the basic drugs that people will use at music festivals. Um, again, I, uh, this is very much a brief scratching of the surface, but I hope it was helpful and provided you with a little bit more information than you might have had before. And you'll have some ability to recognize these people in your future duties in the post-COVID area once everything uh, settles out. So in terms of references, I can send these out if anybody wants them or um, can chat about the, I'll put the slide up at the end as well. Um, so dancesafe.org is a useful uh, website that's designed for uh, people participating in recreational drug use as a safe, reliable resource. Um, uh, 
to go to. Uh, Arrowid.org is a fascinating website. It's basically an amalgamation of peer-reviewed uh, <laughs> reviews of drug use. So people will comment on their experiences with all sorts of different drugs and all the effects that they have from a first-person um, uh, perspective. It's pretty, yeah, it's actually pretty fascinating. Uh, the Canadian Centre on Substance Abuse and Health Canada have very good, reliable, up-to-date resources, and then uh, just some stuff I used to prep, prep the uh, presentation at the bottom. Um, if you're ever by yourself and you don't have access to an ER or um, uh, you're at a, a remote festival, you can, if you have cell service, you can always call the BC Poison Control Centre um, for advice. Right, I'm just gonna put these messages up as I was asked before I forget. And then we can go to any uh, questions on the last little bit and then open it up to general questions about anything um, before finishing off. Sure, so there's a couple questions here. Mike asks, are there any other causes of serotonin syndrome? I can think of MAOI plus tyramine. Yeah, yeah, awesome, awesome, awesome example. Um, so yeah, MAUIs are an uh, interesting medication previously used uh, in a couple of different ways, but they're um, antidepressants, antihypertensive medications for blood pressure management, but they're really, really crude medications with really, really high um, <laughs> risks associated with them. They're really almost not used anymore. They're sometimes used for dementia or Parkinson's, but um, yeah, you're right. Uh, so tyramine and, and MAOIs uh, are, are certainly high risk. Uh, a lot of opioids have uh, serotonergic effects to them, uh, um, uh, specifically meparidine, uh, Demerol. Uh, that's why it's not really used anymore. There was a very famous case that um, resulted in benefit to me as a resident. Uh, so a case of Libby Zion in New York State, where I don't Honestly, in retrospect, I don't know that it was honestly a result of sleep deprivation, but there was a uh, medical mistake made where a, a resident prescribed Demerol to a, a young girl who was already on uh, an antidepressant medication, which had serotonergic effects, and it caused serotonin syndrome, and she died because of it. So as a result of that, they put in uh, resident work hour restrictions uh, for our uh, the U.S. and subsequently Canada, um, but yeah, you're right. Uh, lots of different medicines, antidepressants, antipsychotics, lots of uh, classes of medications for serotonin syndrome. Uh, there's a question from Michael, and he asks, "What is the antidote or intervention for MDMA?" Yeah, sorry, I must. Have, I guess skipped over that. So. Uh, Depends whether you're talking, depends which component of MDMA you're talking about. So if you're just talking about the sympathetic response, so the elevated blood pressure, heart rate, agitation, then generally benzodiazepines are going to be your directed response plus supportive management. So treat the dehydration, uh, conservative management, um, just probably with IV fluids and rest. Um, if we're talking about the other complications, so if they have an arrhythmia, treat the arrhythmia, whether with electricity or other medications. Uh, if they have uh, serotonin syndrome, usually that's supportive care, um, mostly with controlling their temperature. Like I said, that's the most dangerous component of a lot of these things is the elevated temperature and just treating that with aggressive cooling measures. Um, but there is a specific uh, medication that we use as a theoretical antidote for serotonin syndrome called ciproheptadine. Very, very poor evidence for its use, and we almost never use it, even if we do have a serotonin syndrome, but it's just out there if you wanted to know about it. Uh, and then, um, what was the, oh yeah, hyponatremia, so low sodium, so if they get water toxicity, uh, it depends on the severity of it. If they're seizing, then we'll give them what's called 3% normal saline, so high concentration saline, uh, or potentially sodium bicarbonate, uh, to get their sodium back up to the point that they stop seizing. Uh, otherwise, we just restrict the amount of water that they can get and make sure that they have, uh, uh, that they're rehydrated. Uh, there was a question earlier about the effects of GHB when it's combined with alcohol. I don't know if you want to elaborate on how things potentiate when mixed. Yeah, yeah. So kind of as you'd expect, it's uh, synergistic. So 
the add alcohol, the GHB, they both act on the exact same receptor. So uh, it's a huge part of a lot of these sedative medications. I didn't touch on it because it, it gets a bit complicated, but there's a um, GABA is G-A-B-A is a uh, what's called an inhibitory neurotransmitter in your central nervous system. Um, so when you release GABA at certain nerve terminals, it basically dampens everything down. So if you think of you take alcohol and it generally dampens things down, you take GHB, it dampens things down, you take both together, everything really comes down. So yeah, they can be very dangerous if they're taken together. Exact same thing with benzodiazepines. They're almost all the same medication. Um, they all work on GABA. They do work on slightly different GABA receptors, GABA A, GABA B. Anyways, very complicated, but um, they're very similar. And similar to alcohol, you can have GHB withdrawal that appears very similar to alcohol withdrawal. You can have benzo withdrawal, which appears very similar to alcohol withdrawal because you've just taken away that regular steady GABA that they get. So there's a question from Nicole and she asks, what are bath salts? There's an increase in overdoses in the interior due to supply shortages. Why would that increase overdoses? Yeah, um, so, sorry, say, say that last part of the question one more time. Um, there's so an increase in ODs due to supply shortages and why would that increase overdoses? Um, I hadn't heard about that uh, in terms of the shortages of bath salts increasing overdoses. That's interesting. I'll have to look at that. Um, bath salts are an interesting uh, type of medication. You can think of them essentially as, again, stimulants. They're within the sympathomimetic um, family. Their name is, is their synthetic cathinone, um, but it's very similar to um, if anybody's heard of cot, which is a common plant that's grown in um, kind of Eastern Africa, a lot of those countries, people will chew on it. It's very similar. It's kind of like our caffeine. Um, they'll just chew on it and gives them like kind of a little bit of a high, keeps them alert, um, active and interesting. But bath salts are just like the synthetic extreme of that. So again, fairly similar, but with some different effects uh, than methamphetamines. Uh, they're fairly cheap. Um, they're another one that are often sold under names like um, plant food or other not for human use products that um, people can sell and then they, they don't get them uh, outlawed by the uh, US um, uh, Drug Enforcement Agency or the FDA because they're being sold as something else. Yeah, good question. I'm not sure about that. Uh, the, the increase in overdoses, I'll have to look that up. Uh, so it was a clarification. I guess people are turning to bath salts with uh, decreased supply on the streets. I know here at least, at least here in Victoria with the American border closed and people not moving around as much, the supply of street drugs either has decreased or it's changed in the sense that uh, substances that are out there being cut with more to preserve what there is or people are just turning to other things which increases ODs and of course all the supervised consumption sites and OD prevention sites are shut down so that also contributes to the increased numbers of ODs we're seeing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I don't have a, a great answer for you on that. I haven't seen any any research done on it so far. Um, there might be some stuff out there, but um, I can try and take a look and send it out if I find anything. But yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating question. And definitely that's a very underserved population that's being kind of left out in the cold, very vulnerable people who are, um, you know, potentially not able to self-medicate as they would and they are turning to other and potentially more dangerous uh, uh, substances in, in lieu of their regular supply. Yeah, good question, comment. Uh, so someone asks, what about the use of salvia? What would an overdose look like? That's a good question. I don't think I've ever actually seen a salvia overdose. Is anybody else? And feel free to unmute yourselves if, if you want to add in to the conversation. 
Um, I mean, it's a hallucinogen, so I, I would just assume it probably be similar to LSD or, or um, you know, psilocybin or one of the other um, hallucinogens. Uh, I, I, we don't really see it at all or very often here. Um, so uh, I would have to look it up because it's not one I've really read a lot about uh, in terms of if there's any direct toxicity outside of just the, the hallucinogenic components. Um, yeah, if I saw it, I would just probably call poison control and ask them. But uh, yeah, that's a good question. Not sure if anybody else had commented, if they know. Uh, no comments about salvia, but people are, people are asking about different substances. There's a question about um, spice and synthetic marijuana. And then yeah. someone is asking about, and here comes my Eastern European accent, crocodile. Yeah, and do yeah. we see it here? So crocodile, I'll just uh, answer first. That was, I forget what year, what year that was, but it was at least three or four years ago, I think now. Um, came originally from Russia, but it was basically just a um, specific type of a gain stimulant that uh, type of bath salts essentially that uh, had um, necrotic effects on the skin. And so people would basically just get their skin starting to fall off. Um, I can't remember what the exact mechanism is behind the skin falling off. There's uh, something similar that's interesting in cocaine users. Um, levamazole, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that, but cocaine users can get something called a levamazole induced vasculitis, where they basically, it irritates the blood vessels and causes them to constrict down to the point where your skin gets no blood flow and you basically just get giant ulcerations and black necrotic um, uh, spots all over your skin and it can be potentially life-threatening depending on um, uh, depending on each person's presentation uh, yeah no sorry I don't uh, I don't have a huge amount more detail on the crocodile on the crocodile uh, just because we don't really see it anymore I know it was in I want to say in Alberta um, a lot more than BC I don't believe we have had any cases of it for quite some time in, in if at all in BC um, and if anybody else knows otherwise, please feel free to chime in. Um, and then the last, um, the other comment, what was the question about spice? Um, Dean asks, what about spice, synthetic marijuana, opposite effects? I'm not quite sure what you mean there, Dean. <laughs> if you want to elaborate. Um, so I'll just, well, well, while well, Dean's typing, maybe I'll just generally comment. So, uh, so spice is a synthetic cannabinoid. Um, the reason it kind of came to be popularized is because it doesn't show up on urine drug screening. And so it's quite popular among people who are uh, having to undergo regular urine drug screens for work. Um, they can take basically as much uh, spice as they want and it'll never show up in the test. Um, just a caveat to urine drug screening is it tells you nothing about how recently they actually took it. It ranges for different people from, you can detect it anywhere from a week to four weeks, sometimes even eight weeks out uh, from somebody having used. And it tells you nothing about whether they have any active intoxication with marijuana or with cannabinoids. Um, in terms of spice, there's a couple of interesting components to it as well. Uh, one uh, is that they, they get an interesting delayed psychosis. Uh, so anywhere from like a couple weeks to months later, they can present with uh, a new onset of, again, hallucinations, delusions, and totally disorganized speech and behavior, um, like somebody who has schizophrenia uh, as a result of that spice. And sometimes, a lot of the time it'll go away, but sometimes it can actually be permanent for those people. Uh, marijuana itself is associated with early onset psychosis and schizophrenia, but spice is much, much stronger, a much stronger association. Um, things like general kind of uh, colloquial names for spice would be like K2 um, or just synthetic marijuana. Another interesting one that was in the news uh, last year was spice that was contaminated with uh, basically rat poison. It was a super um, potent 
what's called vitamin K inhibitor, which is essentially the same as warfarin or Coumadin, uh, which is an, a blood thinner that people use for uh, all sorts of reasons, atrial fibrillation, or, or, um, artificial valves. Uh, and it got somehow into the, into the supply of spice. And so people were coming in looking basically like Ebola patients with bleeding out of their eyes, bleeding from their gut, bleeding absolutely everywhere to the point where they, a lot of, you know, there were a decent number of deaths, I think a few hundred deaths in, I think it was, I want to say Michigan, um, last year as a result of a, a spice kind of contamination. Uh, there's no more questions at the moment. Uh, Shirley just mentions, good session, Andrew. Whenever you're coming to Kamloops, let us know, and maybe you can join us for a meeting at Division 518. Cool. Sounds good. Thanks for the invitation. I appreciate it. I'm, uh, I should have, should have joined you last year. I was there for about a month and a half, but uh, busy, busy in the ER, but I have a cabin just up near Chase, so I'd definitely love to join you at some point. Uh, any other questions, you guys? If anybody has anything they don't want to say in front of the group, I'll stick around for five or ten minutes if you um, wanted to chat separately. All right. Thanks so much for coming out. Appreciate everybody taking the time, and uh, hopefully that was helpful. Yeah, that was that was a really good talk, Andrew. Thanks for sharing your time with us. No problem. Um, and. The invitations for next week will be sent out tomorrow. Next Monday, we will have uh, Dr. Nav Chima, our Divisional Medical Officer here at 176. He's going to be presenting a talk on airways, I want to say. We'll go with that for now. No, no but, <laughs> um, so stay tuned for that. And yeah, um, we have recorded this session and we'll be posting it to our YouTube channel and you will get the link. Um, someone's asking, will this be on YouTube? It will be probably tomorrow, hopefully. Um, so we'll send out the links to that as well. And I'll just say, if anyone has any questions they want like talked about specifically in preparation, just send them to you and then you can send them on to me. Okay. So uh, that was NAV talking. So if anyone has any questions, I guess, about airways, airway management, NAV is kind of the specialist around 176 on that topic. Uh, so send them to me. My email address uh, was on the screen just a bit earlier, uh, and NAV can address them next week. Otherwise, we'll see you all on, at 7 o'clock next Monday. And if anybody is, is sticking around for additional questions, just let me know. Is uh, Nick working tonight, Anna? Yeah, he's on nights tonight. Uh, so no real questions coming up. People are vacating the, the meeting pretty quickly here. So. Perfect. Awesome. Well, I will vacate as well. Thanks so much for All right. Me. Thank you. Cool. Take care. Take care. Bye.